into that enabling fire called the beauty of the Lord. Lord, here I ask You in 1 Samuel 21, this 13th session, that You would show us the beauty of shame-free living that You revealed to Your servant David. We thank You for that in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Session 13, we're going to call it David, the beauty of shame-free living. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. I'll tell you the story. And then we're going to look at the discovery that David had at the end of this very, very dramatic story. This is one of the great tragedies in David's life, 1 Samuel 21. By the way, the uh, whole of this course will be confined to 1 Samuel. We won't actually get into the other parts of David's life because it would take many, many sessions to do that. And 1 Samuel uh, uh, chapter 16 to 31 is actually the part that depicts David's struggle. 2 Samuel really shows what David does in prosperity, and since most of us are still in the struggle stage, it seems appropriate to focus our energy, since we only have 20 sessions, upon the beauty of the Lord as it's revealed through Psalms and the episodes of the first part of David's life. During his early anointing and being crowned, I mean, being trained in the wilderness, and it ends uh, at him being crowned as king at age 30 years old. And that's as far as we're going to be able to get on this course. And maybe we'll do a part two in a year or two and, and do uh, uh, the second part of David's life. Okay, chapter 21, verse 1. One of the great tragedies of David's life. Now David came to the city of Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid... When he went out and met David, he said to him, Why are you alone and there is nobody with you? First, the city of Nob was the place where the tabernacle of Moses was established. Shiloh was the original place and it was destroyed. And the Ark of the Covenant was stolen and, and by the, the Philistines. And it was recovered, but it was left in disrepair, kind of out of the way. And it wasn't even returned to the tabernacle of Moses and and so in the most holy place, the ark wasn't there. That was one of David's uh, real important things to do when he became king was to get the ark of the covenant back into the, the holy place. But here at the city of Nob was where the, the tabernacle was set up until David had it moved to Jerusalem and then put the ark in it and all kinds of things. And Ahimelech is one of the descendants and his household of, the, of uh, Eli, Eli the priest, his family line. Because Eli's priesthood, it's a very dramatic story because they fell into grievous sin before the Lord, that the Lord spoke a word of judgment in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 1 Samuel chapter 3 over the priesthood of Eli, over his family. Two different places this judgment is proclaimed, and what's going to happen is that this judgment is actually going to be worked out in this, in this episode of David's life, and we'll look at it in a little bit more detail in a few moments. Well, Ahimelech, the high priest, which actually would have been the second in command in the nation of Israel. First, there's the king, and it's a brand new king. Up until that point in time, the high priest and the judge, or the main prophet, would have been the main two people seen as authority. So Ahimelech is the high priest operating in the priesthood in the city of Nob, and he's afraid. Because number one, he's heard rumors that things with Saul and David aren't exactly right, that David is lost some of Saul's favor. The rumors have been traveling around quite a bit that the, that the king is, is angry with his, uh, with his new son-in-law. And Saul's anger is well known around the nation. People have been hearing the horror stories of what he's doing. And so Ahimelech comes and the first thing that he says, he goes, you know, I'm, I'm, un, I'm not really settled about you being here by yourself. And David wasn't by himself in the technical sense. He did have some young men traveling with him that were like helpers. He meant by himself in terms of there were no other military leadership with him. And that was unusual in a time like Israel where there were so many raiding, marauding bands of the enemy for, uh, for one or two guys to travel with, you know, a few of their assistants. They would typically get travel, travel in groups with military leadership involved because it was very dangerous and, and it, it was a, a kind of alarming to Ahimelech and rightfully so. He says, uh, you're all by yourself. And a couple of times David references the young men that are with 
him, and so just so you don't think it's a contradiction. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus uses this very passage of David going to the city of Nob with the young men. And Jesus even mentions the young men that, that are with uh, David at this point in time and how David took the consecrated bread and he ate it and he broke the rules, so to speak. And Jesus was using this very passage of Scripture to validate uh, the necessity of saving human life even if you break the ritual ceremonies of the law of Moses, that the law of Moses was made to bring life, not to take away life. And this was the passage that he talks about when he references uh, healing on the Sabbath. Uh, on the Sabbath. Okay, in verse 2, David tells his first just out-and-out out blatant lie recorded in the life of David. And the problem with it is that the lies continue. They don't stop here. Matter of fact, they get more grievous as time goes on. Or I don't know, more grievous because the whole city ends up being wiped out, but certainly David gets more familiar with telling lies. He gets more comfortable with it. 1 Samuel 27, he really develops it. And what's happening in verse 2 when David said to him, elect, the king has ordered me on some business, and he said to me, don't let anybody know about anything, you know, about this business I'm sending you on. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. And and Ahimelech says, okay, that doesn't sound right, because it's very, very dangerous traveling with all these Philistines and all these neighboring nations. Because remember, the nations were, you know, about the size you know, of a, of, a, of a city in, in, in our day. Actually, it didn't even have that many people, some of them. And they said, okay, and David just blatantly lying. And what's happening is that the, the statement that David uses so regularly in the book of Psalms is, Lord, do not hide your face from me. He's talking about his manifest presence. And what's happening is that the grace of the Lord, the manifest presence of the Lord is not resting on David. This is my theory. And, of course, many would, would uh, have the same theory that the face of the Lord, the manifest presence that's quickening, that's energizing David's life is not in the same uh, degree of manifestation. That doesn't mean it's the Lord's fault. That's not what's going on. But the Lord's seasons in our life where the grace of God is manifest in a discernible way upon us and in other seasons it's not as discernible upon us. When he was standing before Goliath some early years earlier, he felt this divine boldness laying hold of him and now he's standing before a priest that loves God and he can't be truthful because he doesn't know he's so he's trembling in fear and fear's dominating his life right now. And this is a new experience for, for David. He was so used to being bolstered up by the grace of God in his heart. And I think one of the key verses is first Chronicles, actually Second Chronicles, chapter thirty two. Second Chronicles thirty two, verse thirty one. It's a, an important one where it says the Lord In the essence of it, he hid his face from King Hezekiah to test and see what was in his heart. There are seasons in our life where the Lord withdraws the manifest grace upon our hearts to test what is in our heart. It's one of the principles that I underline so regularly when I teach the book of Song of Solomon. Is that one of the great twofold tests in Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 6 is when the Lord withholds His presence from the bride in order to test her heart and establish her in what God has put into her life up to that point in time. When the Lord withholds that manifest presence, all kinds of strange dynamics take place. Our, we see our true weakness, humility is established, and we can even see the, the, the measure of foundation that's been established in our life up to that point in time. Well, right now, boldness is not operating in David's life. And he tells, he begins a season where he gets more and more comfortable with telling lies. From verse 3 to 6, I don't want to go into the details of that. Basically, it's where the, uh, the high priest, Ahimelech, tells David, David says, can I, basically, he asks for three things. He goes, can I, I, need, I need weapons, number one. I need food, number two. And I need you to seek the Lord. I need you to inquire of the Lord for me. In other words, to receive direction from the Lord so that my path will be blessed. Because the high priest had this, this garment called the linen ephod. And in the linen ephod, there were these pockets of which it's a strange concept, but these two stones called the Urim and the Thummim were resident in those two pockets. And it was a Old Testament version of casting lots. Nobody knows for sure. There's all kinds of theories how those two stones, the Urim and the Thummim, operated, but they were in the pockets of the ephod. Most people agree that it was some kind of uh, 
uh, the way that the Lord would answer yes to no questions. And when they would inquire of the Lord, like bring the ephod, to, they'd go to the high priest because the high priest would have possession of it. And they would cast these two stones or some of them say one of them would have a brightness on it or, or there, I don't know, nobody really knows, but some way the yes to no questions were answered when the king or the anointed of the Lord would ask the question. They would get the yes to no answer right on the spot. And David went and asked that favor for, for them to inquire of the Lord. It says that in chapter 22, verse 10, that he went and asked them for this kind of blessing because to help in this way was to give the full support, to give food, weapons, and to inquire of the Lord for them so that God's prosperity would be on his life was full cooperation. But in verse 3 to 6, he's asking for the food. And again, it's the principle of the consecrated bread because... David and his men had not kept all the rules necessary in order to partake of the consecrated bread. You know, it's like somebody being hungry and breaking into the church, you know, and going back in the closet and taking all the communion wafers or something. I mean, literally, and, and you kind of go, that's kind of funny sounding, you know, it just kind of leaves you, fun, you know, kind of feeling kind of, uh, you know, like, well, well, what do you think about that one? Anyway, it was that kind of thing, and it was, it was not a, a common thing, but it's amazing that Jesus actually endorses that practice because it, it, act, it saved David's life. But that's a whole other point. That's not the point I want to get into. I just wanted you to be aware of that. And so he asked for those three things. The inquire of the Lord, he asked for food, and he asked for weapons. And in verse 8, uh, no, verse 7, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there. This is key. His name is Doeg. He's the key personality here. He's the key bad guy. Doeg, the Edomite the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. He was one of Saul's top guys. He was over all of Saul's flock. He probably had a very, very large staff under him. He was a, he was a man of influence. He was a man of wealth and power to have this kind of, of position over the king's, uh, all of his herds because they would have been very vast because the king would have established a, tax, a, a taxation system of which he would have been very wealthy by now. And so Doeg the Edomite was a powerful man in the king's court. And, and Doeg is... David knows Doeg, and Doeg knows David because they were in the court together for some years, you know, in the top administration of, of Saul's government. And David sees Doeg, and he's an Edomite. And an Edomite, for those of you that follow the Bible symbolism, the Edomites or the Amalekites or the Agagites, sounds like a strange name, but there really were a group of people called that. They were all related, the Edomites the Amalekites, and they all were related and they spoke of the principle of flesh that was an enmity against God's purpose. And God made a vow to Israel back in Exodus 17. He would destroy and cut off all the Edomites. He would wipe them out entirely. As a matter of fact, one of Saul's big problems when he first was rejected for being king, God told him to go kill all the Amalekites, which were Edomites. They were really all the same family. And Saul refused to do it. And so Saul refused to enact the fulfillment of a covenant that God made that the Edomites would be exterminated and for good reason. And Saul's allegiance to the Edomites is what caused him to be rejected from being king because it was a very serious thing. He was causing the oath of the Lord not to be established. You don't want to get between the Lord and His promises after He's anointed you graciously in a place of leadership than to defy Him after the prophet of God had uh, so clearly laid it out. Well, anyway, Saul is so not in a good way that an Edomite is over all of his herds. I mean, it's like, Saul, you're still not getting it. What is an Edomite being over your wealth? Well, he's good with money. He's good with numbers. Saul, think about it. You were rejected from being king because of your allegiance to these people. Well, I don't know. Things seem to be okay. I mean, it's this kind of... Uh, this mindset that, that Saul has. Okay, these are all very uh, minor little subplots here, but verse 8, i got to get to the key points here. David said to Ahimelech, is there, not a, is there not on hand a spear or a sword? Give me some weapons. Give me food, give me prayer, and give me weapons. And when he said prayer, they, he meant give me some prophetic ministry here. For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. That's kind of lie number two or... Or, you know, point B under the same lie. You know, A was earlier, now this is point B. So the priest said, Well, the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is wrapped in the cloth behind the ephod. 
if you will take that, then take it. But there's none other except that one. And David looked. guy said, ooh, there's none like it. Give it to me. Yes, I like this sword. And it was uh, in the tabernacle because it was, as, it was like a trophy. It was like a, a, uh, a statement of remembrance as to God's victory for Israel. Okay, we already looked at uh, the last session about David going to Gath and, and all of that. So we're going to go on down to chapter 22, verse 6 and pick up the story. David's lies are going to be very, very costly in the nation. Okay, verse 6 to 8, Saul gets into some really serious self-pity. Chapter 22, 6 to 8. Here he is, the most powerful man, and, he, and uh, he's really hurting because 3,000 paid assassins can't defeat David. And he's going, he says, everybody's on David's side. You know, David wouldn't have agreed with that at all, but verse 6, Saul heard that David and the three men who were with him had been discovered. The uh, men who were with David had been discovered. Now, Saul was staying in Gibeah, and he was rest, which is his cap, you know, the, his residence. It's where the main king's house was. And uh, he's under this tree with his spear in his hand, and all of his servants were standing about him. If I was his servants, that spear in the hand, I'd say, Saul, you know, why don't you just go ahead and lay that little spear down? <laughs> Take a nap, and uh, we'll get the spear if you need it. Okay, verse 7. Then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, you Benjaminites. And he was from the tribe of Benjamin as well. Saul was. So he's, apl- he's appealing to tribal loyalty here. He goes, All you guys that are blood with me, he goes, Will the son of Jesse, that's of course King, I mean David, will he give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you captains of thousands and hundreds of thousands? He says, Is David going to make you rich and famous? And they're looking at him, all these sons of Benjamin who are family members of Saul, at least in his same tribe, and they're like, what are you getting at? And he goes, all of you have conspired against me. All of you are traitors. And they're looking at Saul saying, Saul, you've gone mad. There's no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with David. He goes, I found out the other day my own son is in, is in covenant relationship with my enemy. He goes, and none of you guys will even tell me. Look at, now look at this next one. There is not one of you who feels sorry for me. Not one of you that we revealed to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me. In other words, he's saying, Jonathan has stirred David up to lie in wait to kill me one day. I mean, Saul's imagination is just out of control. He is imagining that David is going to, going to lie in wait and seize the opportunity and assassinate him because that's what he would do to David. And he says, my son's going to tell him where I'm at and where, when I'm going there, and David's going to jump out of the bushes and kill me. And none of you will help me, and you think David's going to make you rich and famous. But he's not. He's not from the tribe of Benjamin. He's from the tribe of Judah. He'll just forget you guys. That's, that's what he's uh, appealing to the men around him. And I imagine they're kind of looking at each other, at, da- at Saul kind of saying, like, just don't say anything. Just don't say anything. Just be quiet. And then answered Doeg the Edomite, his uh, faithful servant, who was set over the servants of Saul. So it says over all of his herds. Now he's, he's over all of his, his like his, his uh, all of his support team, if you will, his support staff. He's over the whole bit of it. He says, "I saw the son of Jesse." They won't even call him David. They call him the son of Jesse. I think when they call him by his name, it just bothers them because they actually love this guy. They really do, and they they they've had to make him an enemy in order to continue in their hostility against him. I don't doubt that, that uh, Saul made a rule and nobody can call him David. That means beloved of the Lord. Nobody. He's the son of Jesse. That's who he is. Well, the prophecy said that out of the root of Jesse would come the Messiah. So, well, he's going to get in trouble on that one too. Okay, verse 9. Doeg the Edomite, who was set over all the servants of Saul, said... I saw the son of Jesse going down to the city of Nob, and I saw Ahimelech, the high priest. Verse 10, he inquired of the Lord for him. I mean, he sought the Lord and, and received the word of the Lord to help David. He says, no. He goes, yeah, he did. He gave him provisions. He gave him food and extra clothing. He gave him the sword of Goliath. David, going to come after you. He's got a sword now. He's got a sword now? Yes. Of course, 
Saul didn't know. David was kind of as delirious as he was. Saul, David, as we know, with the, with the sword of Goliath, went to Goliath's hometown with Goliath's sword. Everybody's messed up right now in this whole story. Everybody's confused. Everybody has a has a, their got fogginess in their thinking. So the king sent to Ahimelech, to the high priest, and, and to all of his father's house, and the priests who were in the city of Nob. And he says, all of you come to Gibeah. Come on up. You know, it's just some miles, 10 or 20 miles, what, whatever. He says, I need all of you right now. And Ahimelech's thinking, did David lie to us, or are we going to be rewarded for helping him? Hmm. Ahimelech is nervous. You can be sure of that, but he's, he doesn't know for sure, for sure what's going to happen. Verse 12, so they're all in Gibeah, they're all before the king. And verse 12, Saul said, here now. And the high priest says, here I am. Saul said, why have you conspired against me? I can see the, the, his, his staff, the Benjaminites, going, he's using that old conspired against me theory again. Now he's using it on all the priests of the Lord, the main priests in the nation. I mean, Saul, Saul had this demon, this jealous demon, everything was a conspiracy to him. He truly was paranoid, for real. And he was, had demonic energy on him. You've all conspired against me. I mean, this is his same strategy. You and the son of Jesse. You gave him bread. You gave him a sword. You, you received the prophetic word for him. And I know why you did it. That he would rise up against me. That he would hide in the bushes one of these days and with the sword he would jump out and kill me. That's the idea. But he would lie in wait. Saul was absolutely gripped by the idea that David wanted to take something from him. He believed that everyone was in a conspiracy against him and that David was really trying to assassinate him because he really basically attributed to David what he was. Because that's what he would have done in the opposite circumstance. So Ahimelech, verse 14, answers and who among all of your servants is as faithful as David? He says the word there, David. Don't say that name. He's your own son-in-law. He does your bidding. He's honorable. He loves you. He brags on you everywhere that he goes. He wins battles for you, and you get credit for it. What are you, what are you talking about, Saul? Verse 15. Did I be just begin to pray to God for David? He goes, do you think I just started asking the Lord to bless David? Far be it. I've been praying for David for years, is what he's saying. And he goes, this is not, what do you mean? This is what I'm supposed to do. Let not the king impute any of anything to his servant or to anything to the house of my father, for your king knew nothing of all of this. For your servant knew nothing of all of this, little or much. I didn't have a whisper that there was something going on between you and David. I didn't even have a hint of it. Probably not entirely true, because he was afraid in verse 1 of chapter 21. If he's afraid, something's going on, but... Who knows for sure? And the king said, you shall surely die, you and all your house. What a statement. The king said to the guards who stood about him, uh, all the guards, kill the priests of the Lord. Because their hands with David, because they knew when he fled, he did not tell it to me. But the servants of the king says, no way. No way. We are not killing. You kill us. We are not killing God's priests. We are not doing it. So there's a lot of tension going on. And verse 18, the, old, the good old Edomite, Doeg the Edomite says, I'll kill him. So he killed the 85 men who wore the ephod, which just means the 85 priests. He killed them all. He took a sword out. Here's their, these defenseless priests. They have no experience in battle. They have no weapons. They're standing there with no defense, and he just slaughters every one of them. That wasn't enough. Verse 19, he goes down to the city of Nob, to the city of the priests. He takes this, that sword and he kills all the men, all the women, all the children, all the infants, all the oxen, all the donkey, all the sheep. He slaughters them all. Incidentally, what's so, so interesting is that the Edomite does to Israel what Saul was supposed to do to the Edomites back in chapter 15. This is exactly the description of what Samuel the prophet said. When you come against the Amalekites, the children, the oxen, the sheep, everything, do it because the Lord has made a covenant to exterminate them for reasons, again, it, it's a long story, but the Lord's reasons were, were, were good. 
And the enemies of the Lord were willing to do this to the priests of the Lord, but the king wouldn't do it to the enemies of the Lord. The very thing. Slaughtered the whole city. Now, you, you have to know that David has significant responsibility in this. Now, one of the sons of Ahimelech, Abathar, the only one he escaped, and he fled after David. He probably ran up to David, his face, you know, eyes swollen with by tears, and he told David, I mean, the tragedy of tragedy, all of the priests have been slaughtered, the worst massacre in the history in terms of the priesthood. Saul had them all killed. David said, I knew it. I knew it when Doeg when, when, when Do was there. I knew he would tell Saul, I know that guy. He, he would do anything for money, anything. He said, why, did, why wasn't I more careful? I have caused the death of all the persons of your entire house, which was true. Not fully true, because Saul was responsible, Doeg was responsible, David was responsible. That's three that are responsible. And the fourth, which again, it's, it's really kind of a very, very uh, interesting thing. And you can read it in 1 Samuel 2. You can read it on your own, verse 31 to 36. And you want to get those verses down and read them. It's very interesting. 1 Samuel 2, 31 to 36. 1 Samuel 3, verse 12 to 14. Back when Samuel was just a little boy, when Eli was sinning against Israel and the Ark of the Covenant was stolen, the prophet of God, not Samuel, he was just a boy, an unnamed prophet came in and spoke and it said, not too distant future from now, all of the priests in your family line will be cut off in the flower of their life. They'll all be exterminated in one day. And when Israel hears it, their ears will tingle. They were prophesying of this day. And the reason that was true was because of a of a number of, I mean, uh, very, very extreme acts of rebellion that Eli's family did against the covenant of the Lord and the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant and just the temple. And the prophet of the Lord says that in your family line, this judgment, now you think, well, that's not fair. Well, you don't want to say that just yet because what typically happens in the Bible when judgment comes on another generation what you don't always understand is that the sins that caused the judgment three generations later have been increasing as the family line goes on. Typically, people's sins are magnified, the Scripture says, for two and three and, three and four generations. Unless there's the breaking of that curse, and I don't mean that it's just a, a curse. The curse isn't just like a demon gets a hold of a family and the family has no more control. That's, it's, it's not exactly like that. Demons have inroads to families, but it's when people are raised in certain sin patterns, the children pick them up. It's, it's a sociologically discerned thing, not just a spiritual. Angry, evil parents beget angry, evil children, typically. Slanderous parents beget slanderous children. Immoral parents typically beget immoral children because the whole value system for years and years and years is, is passed on in a negative way. And so when the Lord says the sins visit three and four generations, it means the pattern typically has strength in it for two and three and four generations later. It can be broken, in our case, through the blood of Jesus. But there's consequences, and typically the consequences are related to the fact that the sin crescendos and grows on that third and fourth generation. It's not like the Lord loses His sense of justice and mercy. You might read it casually and go, well, that doesn't seem very fair, but the Lord's answer is, well, there's a lot more details I didn't say. Sin typically magnifies. Perversions of one generation increase in the next generation. Typically, they don't have to because of Jesus. But if the curse of walking in a lifestyle of sin, it's not just a demon taking hold of you with no, without you having any act of your will. It's just that we get, we're, the atmosphere we live in, we become a part of. You go to immoral parts, you know, where people are all clustered together. They don't think anything about some of the things they do. And you, and you go to a God-fearing home, they'd be horrified to think of the things that seem very commonplace. So it's, it's passed along in those ways. But as well, so in 1 Samuel 2 and 3, the prophet of God said, 
the judgment will come and it will cause all of Israel's ears to tingle on the day that it happens. So we have four contributions to this tragedy. We have the sin of the family line. We have the lie of David. We have the, the evil heart of Doeg. And we have the demonized heart of Saul. All of them are contributing to a, nat a, a national tragedy. And that's typically what happens when a tragedy happens in a, in a massive way. There's so many contributions to it. That's why when a man or a woman casually says, how could the Lord let that happen? And the Lord says, there's many, many storylines involved in this one tragedy that you can't know anything about. Because without the revelation of Scripture, we wouldn't have even any ideas about that. And so in verse 23, David tells Abathar the priest, he says, Stay with me, don't fear. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. He says, Saul's after me. He's really after you too right now because he wants to get rid of you too. And so Abathar is now the new high priest just by default. He says, Stay with me. And Abathar stayed with David right through his reign. Actually, Abathar betrayed David at the very end. The very end. They... They were in their youth together all through those years. At the very end, he betrayed David. A couple of his men did at the very end. A couple of them didn't, but Abathar was one of them. Probably in his heart, he was always mad the fact that his whole family was killed by David's sin. I don't know, but I know that he betrayed David at the very end when, when David chose Solomon to be king instead of one of his other sons. Abathar went with the, with the uh, rebellion that rose up to seize the kingdom, to take it away from Solomon against David's will. Okay. Let's go uh, to Psalm 52. Psalm 52 and tells us a little bit of what David's thinking. Then we're going to come back here to 1 Samuel 23. Psalm 52 tells you what David's thinking. Talking about shame. David knows he's guilty. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine the horror of causing 85 priests and all of their families to be exterminated because you told lies and enraged a jealous king and you knew that king had rage in him. David endangered the entire city. And one reason David, Saul wanted to make an example out of him because he, he, here's what Saul wanted the news to go around. Anybody that helps David will be completely exterminated. As a matter of fact, in 1 Samuel 23, the next chapter we'll look at in a minute, because Psalm 52 is very brief, for Samuel 23, Keilah and the wilderness of Ziph, the next two places David went, they said, Saul, Saul, we found him, we found him. So it worked. All of Israel was absolutely filled with fear to help David. And so what Saul did in, in, in terms of his plan was effective. It created fear everywhere. Psalm 52, look at the title. It says, this is the Psalm David wrote. When Doeg the Edomite went and told Saul and said about him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. So this is what's going on. David writes this directly in the shame and the tragedy. This is one of the greatest tragedies of David's life. He had several of them of this magnitude. Actually, a couple of them worse. But this was his first sin-produced tragedy in the nation of Israel. Again, David had several of them. He had the one with, uh, with Bathsheba. Then he had his family tragedy, which was the fruit of the sin with Uriah and Bathsheba. Then he counted all of Israel at the end of his life, and because of the pride, some large number, 70,000 of Israel were cut off by a plague from the Lord. They were, they were killed by judgment. So David had several of these uh, national tragedies take place related to his sin. People say, I want to be like David. The question is like, what part of David do you want to be like? I want to be like the part of David that is... The good part. Oh, the non-human David. That's what you wanted. David was as human as they came. David's power, which is what this session's all about, was his ability to face shame and get through it and get his feet grounded solid again in God. That, and I've maintained this for, for, for 20 years, the number one feature of David's life was his, his ability to receive the mercy of God and to repent in a genuine way, not just kind of fake repentance, the kind of, put on a show, but it was real, and he would get reestablished, he would regain his balance, if you will, in the grace of God again. He did it like nobody. He was the best repenter and restarter with power and confidence of any man in the Bible. 
he stumbled grievous and had confidence as though he did nothing the next day more than any guy in history. I'm serious in terms of the Bible history. Nobody could do what David did and come back into the love of God in confidence like David could. That is the number one message of David's life. He knew how to walk shame-free. He knew how to find God in truth. He had this unique spirit of revelation upon him. We talked about in the earlier sessions this. The Lord was with him. The Word of the Lord was with him. The spirit of might and revelation was on him. He understood the passion of God's heart, the pleasure of that river of God's personality. Well, in Psalm 52... <clears throat> Verse 1 to 4, just a brief outline, is Doeg's sin being described by David. Verse 1 to 4. Doeg's sin is described by David. Verse 5 to 7 is God's judgment on Doeg. God's judgment on Doeg being described. That's verse 5 to 7. God's judgment on Doeg being described. And then verse 8 and 9, David contrasts his life with Doeg's life. Very, very important contrast. This is a really, this is kind of a, uh, like a simple little psalm. You go, huh. It's a nice little psalm, but if you understand, this is the first tragedy, national tragedy, that David's deliberate sin caused because of his lie and his fear. You understand the significance of this because this is the crisis. This is the turning point in David's life. Because, see, David has known fear, and he, you know, feigned madness in front of Achish, king of Gath, but he hadn't sinned. I mean, his sin was fear. I mean, he, had, he drew back and lost his confidence. But here, a tragedy in the nation. You know, it's the person who breaks the law and goes out drunk and kills five people in a head-on car wreck. That, that's the kind of feeling David has, but far worse, because an entire city is wiped out because of his sin. I don't know if you've ever done anything, even mildly, that caused pain to other people. It's, people live in the tailspin of that for years and years and years. And though David would be the first one to say he didn't take it lightly, he found his balance in the grace of God quickly. I'm not saying that he took it lightly, the tragedy, but somewhere between him and God, he knew God liked him. Though he knew he had responsibility before men. He starts off with a question. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. See, the reason this is such a vital psalm is because both of them lied. Both of them lied and caused the downfall of the city. Doeg actually told lies to Saul and colored it to make Ahimelech look bad because Ahimelech actually really didn't know. He lied because Doeg is just an evil man, it says in this. David, by the spirit of Revelation, verse 3 and 4 it says he loves evil. He loves deceitful words, devouring words. He, he is an evil man. Two men commit the same sin, in essence. They both lie to bring the wrath of a king on a city. Obviously, Doeg does more because he executes the wrath, but it was the, it was the command of Saul that empowered that execution, and that, was, that command was given because two men lied, Doeg and David, and David contrasts the two of them there. First, he calls him a mighty man because he was the head of Saul's support staff, if you will. He's over all of his servants, chapter 22.9. He's over all of his herdsmen, chapter 21.7. That's 22.9 and 21.7. But he asks the question, he goes, why are you boasting in evil instead of repenting of evil? He says, that's my question. Why are you standing and boldly before God and says, Give me what's coming. I'm not afraid of the evil I've committed. He goes, you're boasting in your evil because you don't repent. It's not just that Doeg took money for it, which he did undoubtedly. It's not just that Doeg told other people and bragged about it, which undoubtedly he did. He's boasting in the fact he has the confidence to stand before God not being broken by his evil. He stands resolute with a brazen heart. And that is what I think David is talking about more than anything. He goes... How could you in evil stand with such a calloused heart before the God of heaven when he has so much goodness if you would bow down before him? He goes, I'm getting on the ground. I know what's in his heart. I'm going to receive goodness from the heart of God. This thing is tragic what I did, but I'm going to get reestablished. Doeg, bow down and quit your strutting, brazen arrogance before God. When a sinner commits his sin and will not bow for goodness, he says in his heart, my goodness is sufficient. Or he says in his heart, 
not like Doeg. We have a religious pride in a different way. Doeg's religious pride says, my goodness is sufficient. I'll take my chances at the judgment day. I'm a good enough guy. I'm strong enough. I'm not worried. That's one kind of religious arrogance. There's another kind of religious arrogance that says, my sin is more powerful than God's power to forgive. We stand there and bow, bow, the unrepented guy is boasting by thinking he can stand in God's judgment on the last day by be okay by just ignoring it or bringing his own track record with him. Such arrogance. But the religious arrogance has a downside to it. I can create something more powerful than God. I can create a light brighter than the sun. I can create, I mean, a darkness more powerful than the light of the sun is what I meant to say. And so religious condemnation literally is the inverted side of religious pride. It really is. I can do something that even God in His power can't forgive because God has power, but not that much power. And God says, you have no comprehension what pounds in my being in terms of loving kindness. David says, I'm not going in either direction. The goodness of God, because that's the banner. That's the only banner we're standing for. God, I've sinned. A city's been wiped out. But I know one thing. It endures. It's stronger than my sin. It's stronger than the tragedy. It's stronger than... The defilement of my soul is stronger than everything David begins. The shame-free living by the confession that God's goodness endures over everything, including his own sin, it would actually endure in in Doeg's behalf if he didn't have the overt arrogance versus the covert arrogance. Tell you, when we stand and don't repent, we say, I'll take my chances. Oh, Oh, boastful, proud man, don't take your chances. Before a holy, holy, holy God, you better bow down. Well, it's too late. I've done too bad. And that sounds so sweet, but it it literally is religious pride on the back end. You can produce something stronger than God. The darkness you have is stronger than the power of the sun. Yep. Boy, you must really be something special. He begins with the initial confession of of shame-free living. The goodness of God endures continually. Of course, that's the theme of the whole psalm. And the difference between Doeg and him is that verse 3 and 4, Doeg loved what he was doing. David did it, but hated that he did it. David did it in immaturity. Doeg did it in rebellion. That's the difference. Verse 7. He goes on and talks to Doeg, and he talks about that. He he says, verse uh, verse 5, actually, God's going to pluck you out of your place. He will uproot you, Doeg. Your arrogance will be uprooted. You may live to be 80 years old, but you will be uprooted one day forever. And he says, the righteous will see you uprooted. So he was actually probably prophesying to Doeg for his early demise. Since it found this place, he says, and they will, they shall laugh. And the laugh doesn't mean hilarious. It means they will mock you, mocking God. You have mocked God in your arrogance. They will mock you for it on the, on the end. And that's a difficult concept for all of us to understand. And here's what they will say. Here's the man of God who didn't make, here's the man who didn't make God his strength. Here's the man that trusted in his riches and he trusted in the fact that he strengthened himself in his own wickedness. Now, the bottom line of David's struggle, the bottom line of your struggle is God wants, God wants you to make God your strength. He doesn't want your last three months, your track record to be your strength. That's why he wrestled with Jacob and, and touched his hip. The point of the struggle is so that I don't look at myself as my strength. Like I remember over the years as I have discovered the weakness of my flesh. I've said this for years like a, tra- like a broken record. When I discover the weakness of my flesh, I assume that God just discovered the weakness of my flesh. Oh God, can you believe it? Yeah, I can believe it. No, I just did this grievous thing. Can you believe it? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's not a problem believing it. It's a lot more where that came from. And... Part of spiritual maturity is the journey of self-discovery is exactly the truth about the strength of our heart. My early days when I was shocked, it was only an expression of pride. I didn't understand that. The Lord says, as long as you're shocked, you're always trusting in your dedication to me. I want you to trust in my dedication to you. I want to be the strength of your heart, not you the strength of your heart. I want your dedication to me to flow out of the understanding of my dedication to you. That's when God is your strength. 
when our commitments flow out of gratitude that He likes us more than we could ever like Him, and we go to the table with no bargaining chips, we go to the table before the pure, raw love of God with nothing to contribute, that's when your resolution flows in gratitude and it doesn't get in the way between you and God. Religious dedication, religious resolve that comes before the understanding of mercy typically ends up getting us in difficulty with God. The Lord understands it all, so He's not, he's not troubled by it. He says, okay, He says, well, you die hard, but you will die. I assure you of that. You die hard, but you'll die. This will be a long wrestling match, but I will win. At the end of the day, you will not trust in your dedication to me. You will trust in my dedication to you. And then when you're, when you're just absolutely cut in two by the, that, that unrelenting ache of gratitude, like I have nothing to bring to the table and you like me, just the sheer raw mercy of God, then in that place we say, well, in that case, I'm yours. And the Lord says, now your dedication fits. Now, my message isn't go out and be undedicated to find out how much God loves you. That's not what I'm saying. You seek the Lord with all of your heart. And you seek to make God your strength. That was the opposite of doing, which means we trust in the fact His commitment is greater to us. It's the source of our commitment to Him. And the source of it isn't just the Spirit in a mystical way. Of course, the Spirit does touch us in an invisible way. It's the knowledge of gratitude. I mean, it's the knowledge of what He's done that creates gratitude that creates power. Gratitude is the power of humility. It truly is. David had gratitude. That's why he had abandonment and humility at the same time. And it's, it's a journey. Song of Solomon 8.6 Who's this coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? The Lord. It's the bride at the end of history. That's one application. There's several applications. But the Lord could say, well, she didn't start leaning on me. She didn't like the wilderness. But... I got her in the wilderness and she is leaning and it's really a love affair. It's the real thing. She isn't boasting in herself at all. She's completely falling freely into the fire of the love of God. The goodness of God endures forever. So David says, this is what the mock will be. Who is the man who didn't make God his strength? He thought that he'd take his own chances. His own religious dedication. If it's in our context or in his refusal to repent in Doeg's context. He trusted in his own riches. Now, the riches of Doeg was, he thought, if I have enough money, I can bail myself out of trouble. I'm not worried about eternity. I'll take my chances. In the spiritual sense, we trust in the richness of our dedication. We trust, trust in the richness of our perfect record. And Doeg, he strengthened himself in his own wickedness. He, what, he, what that means is he came up with ways in his conscience where sin would just get worse and worse and worse and he didn't care. But in a strange kind of way, not that David means this, but the principle is just staring at us to, to apply. When we end up trusting in ourselves and our own religious resolves, we actually strengthen ourselves in a way that keeps us failing more and more and more and more. We actually are empowering and enabling ourselves to, keep so, to stay soulish. When the day comes when the revelation of the cross touches us, just a little bit, and the river of God's pleasure, as high as the heavens are above the earth, is mercy, and it rents our heart in two, and we don't try to bring any bargaining chip, we just take it freely. I take it. I just take it. Then all of a sudden, it breaks some of the power of our soulishness. Because our soulishness, our natural strength, is empowered by the fact that we can pull this thing off. When we come to the fact that the only way we're going to make it is in, in a free embrace and then walking in the gratitude of that free embrace. Then the whole bargaining dynamic, the whole image-keeping dynamic is minimized. Now look what David says about himself in verse 8 and 9. This is really something. Verse 8 and 9, he says, I'm like a green olive tree. He goes, that's who I am in the house of God because I, I trust in His mercy. He goes, this goodness of God doctrine, I go all the way in it. He says, I, I'm not trusting in what I did in Doe, I mean, in, in the city of Nob. I, I'm not trusting what I did when I prayed all night, and I'm not trusting what I did. I, I trust in mercy. That's all I trust in. David had an unusual insight into that at a very young age. He said, really amazing. Now, I'm not telling people to get sloppy with sin, because there's a kind of person that gets real heavy on the mercy of God, and they're just real, real 
light on the Word of God and they just run out in their things and it bolsters their confidence. I'm not talking about having confidence to sin. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to bolster our resolve in defying the Word of God. I'm talking about having confidence in an embrace that is outrageous in its kindness because it brings us to repent and to call sin, sin. David says, I'm a, I'm a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. I trust in His mercy. He'll praise you forever. Okay, here's the tragedy. You just went out and broke all the rules and got filled with drugs and alcohol and you had a head-on car wreck and five people got killed, your best friends, and you're singing to praise and I praise His mercy. I tell you, that is a difficult thing to do. I don't mean... I'm a, I'm, there's two points here. I'm not talking about the gloating... The fact that I didn't do wrong, but I'm talking about he's caused the slaughter of a city, but he found a way to enter into praise again with God. The guilt was just gone between him and God. He had no illusions about who he was in his sinful flesh. I, I think this is really, really something. This, this David likens himself to a green olive tree. It's established in a green olive tree in verse, in verse uh, 5. Doeg was plucked up and uprooted. Verse 8, David is established as a green olive tree. And a green olive tree, of course, an olive tree was a, it was a main tree in Israel. A flourishing olive tree, olive tree is the idea. And that imagery of an olive tree is used a number of times in Scripture to depict the beauty and the fruitfulness of the Lord. The anointing oil used to anoint the prophets, the anointing oil and the lamps in the temple are all olive oil. The symbolism of the olive tree, the Garden of Gethsemane, means the olive garden. It's where all the olive trees were. That's not the exact. Uh, that's what it boils down to. I mean, I don't know the exact Hebrew word, but it's where all the olive trees, the oil press was. Is actually, I think, what Gethsemane means, the oil press, because the olive trees were all there, and that's where Jesus went. And the symbolism of of, of oil and olive trees is just—it's fantastic. David says, "I stand." Shame free. I am, an, I am the anointed of the Lord. He says, I am that which God flourishes and God shines through. I mean, everything in our being would be crying out, I am the scum of the earth. Give me 12 months in probation to do bad things and at least suffer in spiritual uh, uh, barrenness and then come back after a year of miserable worship services and say, now God, is the record even? I've suffered for a year. I couldn't feel you for a year. Are you happy? David says, that's foolishness. That's religious pride. He says, I'm a flourishing olive tree right now. The olive tree was the anointing oil, the picture of the anointing oil, the source of light. It's the oil in the lamps. What a statement. I trust in mercy. I know who I am. I know who He is. I'm committed to praising God. I'm not getting into that downward spiral of, of, of rehearsing how evil I am. God says, settle it. You're wicked to the core. Settle it. Quit rediscovering it with such fascination. Come to me. Throw the bargaining away. You're utterly sinful, but I want you because of who I am. Now settle it and don't bring it up and rehearse it every time. David says, I love you. I love you. I love you. He says, okay, come on. I'm not bargaining. I'm yours. I'm yours. That doesn't mean he was trivial about the consequence of his sin to other people. Look what he says. Why will I praise you? For one reason. You've done it, God. You did it. I just caused the city to be wiped out. But you did it. Which means you've redeemed me. You've forgiven me. That's what it means. It is finished. David is reaching into the finished work of the cross. You have done it. And I can come to you every day. I don't have to run from you. I can run to you every time. And he says, and here's what I'm going to do. In the presence of all of your saints, I'm going to wait on you. I'm not going to go on spiritual probation. I'm going to reestablish my devotion life. I'm going to stand for it. Everybody knows that I'm the creep of Israel. Everybody knows that me, Doeg, and Saul made this happen. Everybody does. But I'm not going to walk around with the scarlet letter on me. I'm going right in the presence of God. I am God's. The mercy of God. Verse 1, His goodness endures forever. God did it. I trust His mercy. I'll be a bright and shining oil lamp. A, a, a lamp uh, uh, energized by this oil. And He says, why will I wait on your name? 
Why will I do this? Why will I have the courage to reestablish my devotion life after I lied and caused tragedy? Why will I let people look at me and go, oh, he's in the prayer room again. Isn't it a little bit early to be in the prayer room? No, it's not. It's been 17 minutes since I've done it. I don't have to bear it longer than that. I've said I, I, I've repented. I can go in the prayer room now. Don't you think I've got to wait a month or two at least? No, I shouldn't. That doesn't mean you walk around in arrogance if you've done scandalous sin, flaunting your liberty, but you have your liberty nonetheless. And David ends it like he begins it. Why? Because God is good. That's why. Because I know who you are. He starts off in verse 1. Your goodness is continual. He ends in verse 9. I will reestablish my devotion life today because you're good, because you've done it. I don't trust in my own riches. I don't make myself my strength. Amen and amen. Let's stand. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.